Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Gil Klein. I'm the club's president and a national correspondent for media general newspapers, writing for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, the Tampa Tribune, and the Winston-Salem Journal. I'd like to welcome my fellow club members in the audience today, as well as those of you who are watching us on C-SPAN, or listening to us on National Public Radio, or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before inter introducing our head table guests, I'd like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. On Tuesday, June 7th, tomorrow, Norman Augustine, Chairman and CEO of Martin Marietta, will speak about the defense industry in a speech entitled, Headed for High Noon Again, the Future of the U.S. Defense Industry. On Wednesday, Herbert Kelleher, Chairman of the Board and President and CEO of Southwest Airlines, will present a speech entitled, My Life as an Airline Commissioner. And on uh, Tuesday, June 14th, Bianca Jagger, a longtime human rights activist, will talk about the global refugee crisis. And on Wednesday, June 15th, Mstislav Rostropovich, music director of the National Symphony Orchestra, will present a speech entitled, Current Conditions in Russia. Audio and videotapes of National Press Club lunches are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker, and I trust that you will, please write them on the cards provided for you on your tables, pass them forward, and I will ask as many as time allows. I'd like now to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly as I read their names and for you to withhold your applause until I've read all of the names. Starting on your right is John Mashick of the Boston Globe, Jacqueline Thomas of the Detroit News, Gerald Tohorst, former press secretary to President Ford. Eleanor Clift of Newsweek. Martin Gelman of the Washington Post and the winner of the Ford Foundation Journalism Award for National Defense Reporting. Mary Leonard of Newsday. Martin Allen, chairman of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Christy Wise, a freelance journalist who is chairwoman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Leonard Downey, Jr., executive editor of the Washington Post and accepting the, award, the Ford Foundation Award for reporting on the presidency for Anne DeVroy, who is in uh, Normandy, uh, trying to win next year's award. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Ryan of the Detroit News, and the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Marjorie Hunter, who covered the Ford administration for the New York Times. <laughs> Lawrence O'Rourke of the McClatchy Newspapers. Bob Lewis, senior editor of the uh, AARP Bulletin. Sarah Kellogg, Newhouse News Service. Also, I'd like to thank staff members Melissa Bender, Sherry Burton, Melanie abdel Dermott, and Jeff Tarbell for organizing today's luncheon. We are honored today to have with us President Ford, who for the past seven years has been returning to the National Press Club about this time of year to present the Gerald R. Ford Foundation Awards for distinguished, distinguished reporting on the presidency and national defense. Seven years. Mr. President, I think you have spent more actual time here at the press club than you did in the White House. <laughs> he says he's enjoying it a lot more, too. <laughs> this year marks the 20th anniversary, uh, we're doing anniversary today, of the most unusual transfer of power in American history when Mr. Ford became president following the resignations of Vice President Spiro Agnew and President Nixon. The events leading up to that transfer of power are one of the great watersheds of American politics that continues to influence how our electorate views its leaders. One could argue that there's a line from Watergate through Ross Perot's 1992 insurgency right into the heart of Dan Rostenkowski. But President Ford is not here to talk about the past. He may be the only American over 60 who is not in Normandy today. He is speaking to us uh, on a forward-looking topic, 
about the challenges to America. And certainly in this rapidly changing post-Cold War world, there are many. While President Clinton honors the sacrifices of the soldiers who stormed the beaches in Normandy, the United States is grappling with its role in, as the world's only superpower. As a man who has controlled the military and knows its power and its limits, President Ford should have a perspective on what that role should be. And as a man who served 25 years in Congress, rising to House Minority Leader before being tapped for the Vice Presidency, Mr. Ford should have a perspective on why Congress has fallen to such ill repute and why someone like House Minority Leader Bob Michael is retiring this year, grumbling about the incivility even among his own party's members. And then there are the challenges within the Republican Party. Halle Barber is licking his chops over President Clinton's problems as he sharpens the long knives over the RNC headquarters for this year's congressional elections and the 1996 presidential race. But just across the river in Virginia, the party seems to be self-destructing as it tears itself between its religious right wing and the Main Street wing. So, Mr. President, you have a choice of challenges to America to talk about today, and we are eager to hear what you have to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm press club welcome for President Gerald Ford. I'm going to make the awards first. Right. Okay, thank you. Whatever you like. It's up to you. All right, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Won't you all sit down, please? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gil. <clears throat> As always, it's a very high honor and a great privilege to uh, return to the press club. And as Gil was uh, off the cuff saying I was spending more time here now than I did in the White House, I couldn't help but say I enjoyed it more. <clears throat> but let me say it's a special pleasure to come because uh, the Ford Foundation is always honored to make these awards to journalists who, um, on the basis of a outstanding committee, are chosen for their excellent work in writing on the presidency and the Defense Department. I first should thank the members of the committees, of the two committees that uh, review the material submitted to them for their analysis and decision. It's an outstanding group of objective uh, committee members. I think they do a superb job, and on behalf of the foundation, I thank them very much for their diligent and effective work. Uh, secondly, um, the foundation is uh, pleased to recognize uh, those in the field of journalism for their writings on the presidency and the Defense Department. I got the idea from the Dirksen Foundation that had initiated a program to recognize journalists uh, on the Congress. I thought we should broaden it, and therefore the Ford Foundation does it annually with a $5,000 award to those in uh, the field of uh, the presidency and the Defense Department. Let me get on with the first award um, the one for the presidency has had some great winners over the years. Uh, many of you recognize their names, Lou Cannon, Charlie Cordry, David Hoffman, Susan Page, David Morrison, Ken Walsh, as well as others. And I'm delighted to add to that list the names of two this morning. Uh, the first is a an award for the distinguished writing for the presidency and in this case it goes to Ann Devroy of the Washington Post. In the nomination letter, Ann's editor wrote, and I quote, uh, the stories in her package shows how Devroy put Clinton's first year into context, turning routine White House events into stories that gave special insight into this ambitious and awkward administration. End quote. I didn't say that. <laughs> Her editor did. Now, the panel of judges agreed, and let me quote what they said about Ann's uh, background and work. Ann's ability to dig beneath the surface 
uses sources and analyzes White House information in a clear and interesting style. She also brings humor and a sense of perspective to her stories. She is particularly commended for her, her ability to characterize President Clinton's agenda in terms of the Bush legacy, end quote. I am delighted to recognize Anne on this occasion. She's on duty in Normandy, covering the events uh, that are taking place there today. And it, to accept her award, I would ask Leonard Downey of the Washington Post to come forward and to uh, accept it and to oh, pass on to Anne the uh, trophy as well as the check. Congratulations. Uh, it's, a, it's an especial pleasure <clears throat> for me to receive this award for Anne uh, because she really embodies um, so much of what I think is important about journalism. Uh, she is a, a dogged, inventive um, uh, beat reporter uh, who, uh, who's, who seizes her task to find out everything about what is going on in her beat, in this case the presidency. Uh, she, there is nobody who's not a source of Anne's because she works so hard at, uh, at discovering everybody to be a source and because they have such respect uh, for how she deals with the information that they provide them, that they're always ready to uh, answer her next phone call. Uh, I, I, um, I'm jealous of Anne being on the, on the beaches of Normandy today, but I'm very pleased to be here to receive this for her. Thanks. The uh, next is the award for distinguished reporting uh, on the military or national defense. And the winner in this case is Barton Gelman, also of the Washington Post. As we all know, 1993 was a quite different year for the defense establishment. It was a year in which the armed forces struggled to come to terms with their new civilian overseers, and they were uh, learning or adapting to totally different circumstances going from the Cold War to what we see in what was the Soviet Union. Uh, the panels of judges had many good things to say about Bart's writing. First, they thought his articles offered, and again I quote, lucid explanations and insight that allowed readers to understand, only, understand not only what happened, but why. They thought he was particularly good in assembling information that he could then discuss important technical and operational matters in a language that could be understood by non-specialists. They also thought he demonstrated a noteworthy versatility as a defense reporter providing readers with a broad exposure to important developments in national defense in 1993. Uh, will you please come forward, Bart, and uh, let me make the presentation on behalf of the Ford Foundation. We're honored uh, to recognize you, and I compliment you for a fine job, and uh, the uh, audience will be glad to hear a word or two from you. Thank you. I thought since uh, two of the stories that were submitted uh, on my behalf were uh, set aboard the uh, Theodore Roosevelt that I ought to tell a short sea story uh, which never saw print from my uh, trip aboard that aircraft carrier. I, I walked aboard in Norfolk uh, on a Thursday having promised my wife Tracy that I would be home by Saturday night. <laughs> uh, and this was last March when the big uh, storm hit the East Coast. Uh, and not only did it cover your sidewalk with snow, but it created these enormous chops in the Atlantic, uh, there was uh, the, the the ship was pitching so hard that water was breaking over the flight deck, which is supposed to be ten stories above the water. Uh, and the short of it is that they could not possibly launch a plane to get me off. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, the Roosevelt is starting its deployment, heading over to the Mediterranean. <laughs> and so I'm I'm basically playing Gilligan. Uh, uh, 
on, on this uh, on this uh, voyage here. It's supposed to be a three-hour tour. Uh, you know, tiny ship was tall. It's not that tiny, but it seemed tiny uh, at the time. Uh, they thought for a while of putting me off in Bermuda. And I was thinking about how I was going to make this phone call. Hi, honey. You'll never guess where I am. Uh, but they couldn't, they couldn't get rid of me there either. And so I washed up in the Azores uh, <laughs> without a passport, uh, which the Portuguese government did not think was at all funny. Uh, and uh, the ultimate indignity was when I got back to the newsroom, there was a sign on my desk welcoming back wrong way Gelman, <laughs> which I have been reliably informed was left there by the executive editor of the Washington Post. Thanks, Len. <laughs> One serious word, if I could, uh, when a lot of other news organizations were cutting back on defense coverage uh, and there were articles predicting the demise of defense reporting after the Cold War, the Post kept its commitment to the beat. Uh, they kept two people on it. They gave me the time uh, and budget to travel to see what was going on in the military around the world. And they basically made it possible uh, for me to do my best work. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank my editor, Brad Graham who's here, uh, and the national editor, Fred Barbash, and the assistant managing editor for national news, Karen DeYoung, who consistently rewarded Enterprise uh, and gave me time to do it. Thanks again. Congratulations, Bart. Very proud. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. And now um, I'm allowed a few minutes to make some observations and comments. and. At the conclusion, I will be delighted to uh, respond to some questions which I understand Christy has accumulated. Uh, it has been a uh, wonderful two or three days for those of my age to read about the tremendous job that was done in Normandy on D-Day. It was an example of outstanding heroism. Uh, great dedication under the most difficult circumstances, and uh, I, as well as all Americans, applaud those who uh, gave their lives and those who survived, because it was a fantastic day in the history of the United States. I was one of the 16 million who were in World War II, and as I read of the many sacrifices in Normandy, I became curious where I was on June 6th. So I called my library in Ann Arbor, and I said, will you check the logs of the USS Monterey CVL-26 and see where we were on June 6, 1944? I had been on the ship about a year and a half it was one of the small, fast carriers. And in checking the log, they found that our ship was in the Majuro Atoll, which was one of the atolls in the Marshall Islands, any Weetok and uh, Majuro that were captured and was used as a refueling place, et cetera, for the fleet as it moved on the island hopping operations. And the day of June 6, the log showed that late in the afternoon, I was the officer of the deck as we pulled out of Majuro Harbor, or inlet. Those atolls didn't have much land around them. And we joined with uh, uh, Admiral Spruance's task force to undertake the operation against the enemy that ended up in the great turkey shoot, great Marianas turkey shoot. And let me tell you the magnitude of the size of this armada. There were 15 aircraft carriers, eight of the big ones, seven like the one I was on, six battleships, over 30 cruisers and over a hundred destroyers. 
this was the day that we assembled that the landing in Normandy took place. Now, in no way do I downgrade Normandy, but for the Navy to assemble that kind of an armada, the largest in the history of naval warfare, that ended up with a tremendous victory over the enemy. I think the two operations illustrate the tremendous effort that was made in the United States in a period of approximately three years from December 7, 1941. To be able to launch that kind of an operation in Normandy and a comparable sea organization in the Pacific was a monumental achievement of the United States. I think we should all be proud of what was done in that great effort to prevent aggression around the world. But I also think we ought to reflect on what took place after uh, peace was achieved. And I think it can be a background for what our policies ought to be in the decade of the 1990s. If you'll recall, in the late 1940s, President Truman submitted to the Congress the Greek-Turkish aid pro program to save Greece and Turkey from being overrun. He proposed the Marshall Plan. The Democrats controlled the Congress. The Republicans won term, the 80th Congress, much at the time that Truman was trying to put this legislation through. And he was very lucky, because Senator Arthur Vandenberg from the state of Michigan was chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs. And with a bipartisan effort, President Truman was able to achieve success with the Marshall Plan, which saved Western Europe, gave Western Europe prosperity in contrast to the poverty on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And then, uh, several years later, when a Republican president, President Eisenhower, took office, he was the architect for NATO. But the Democrats controlled the Congress, both the House and the Senate. But President Eisenhower was able to be successful in the authorizing legislation as well as the appropriations for NATO because of cooperation by the Democratic Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, and Lyndon Johnson when he became the majority leader in the Senate. And then a little later, well, as a result of NATO, we had peace in Europe for 40-some years. I'm told, according to historians, that's the longest period in peace in Europe in 200 years. And then a little later, in 1975, my administration uh, joined with 34 other nations, east as well as west, and we ended up with the Helsinki Accords, where we were able to get Mr. Brezhnev and the others on the other side of the Iron Curtain to agree with a program for human rights. I think they regretted it subsequently. But nevertheless, they agreed to it, and we got the necessary support in the Congress among Democrats. The point I am trying to make is that 40-some year period from the end of the war to the collapse of communism was a period of what you can describe as nonpartisanship or bipartisanship, whatever term you want to use. I happen to think that's what we greatly need today in the management and the execution of our foreign policy. I'm a little prejudiced, but I think that four-decade period was one of the finest in the history of U.S. foreign policy. Now, we had an illustration a year ago, just about now, 
of, again, a bipartisan effort, I refer here to the North American Free Trade Agreement. When that was first signed by President Clinton, there were many who doubted it could get through the Senate, and certainly there were serious doubts about it being approved in the House of Representatives. But President Clinton, when he got going on the issue, got the help and assistance of the Republicans, and the net result was, in a very close vote, in the House of Representatives, NAFTA was agreed to. I don't remember the precise figures, but the Democrats got 102 votes out of 250 some, and the Republicans got about 132 out of 170 some. So it was a bipartisan effort in the House particularly that brought about this very essential piece of legislation in foreign policy. If it had been defeated, you would have had the old Smoot-Hawley gang running the show in trade. Fortunately, it prevailed, and I saw some figures uh, in one of the papers over the weekend that foreign trade with Mexico has increased about 20 percent in the first three months of this year compared to the comparable period uh, the previous year. I think that was a giant step forward. Now I'm worried as to whether Congress is going to respond to the GATT Treaty, which has been signed after uh, seven years of negotiations with 117 nations around the world struggling to find an answer to the Uruguay Round. I hope the same bipartisan, nonpartisan relationship exists. I think it was Senator Arthur Vandenberg from my home state who once said foreign policy uh, is bipartisan at the water's edge. I think it's essential as we face different challenges. I guess in retrospect, uh, it was easy when you had two superpowers and both had all kinds of muscle that could have ended up destroying one or the other, maybe both. Today we have a multi-challenge, whether it's Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, uh, North Korea, or China, or Japan. But I don't see why in these critical times we can't find the same formula to meet our challenges in foreign policy today as we did in those very difficult, tough days in World War, uh, following World War II. One thing that always bothers me after the collapse of communism, the destruction of the Berlin Wall, there were people in one political party or another, or there were supporters of one former president or another, who said our administration or my White House won the battle against communism. That's a lot of baloney. You know who won the battle against communism over that 40-some year period? The American people. The American people supported presidents, Democrats, and Republicans. The American people supported members of the House, Democrat and Republican, over a 45-year period. And the majority of those Americans supported candidates and office holders who worked together in achieving a highly successful foreign policy for the benefit of the United States. No president, no political party can claim all the credit. The truth is the American people during that period of time deserve the credit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We do have a lot of questions, and since half of them are the same, 
<laughs> I will start with that one. The Republican Party in Virginia and elsewhere has been thrown into a deep controversy over the nomination of Ali North. Do you support his candidacy and do you urge other Republicans to either support him or to seek out an alternative candidate? I could duck it by saying I don't vote in Virginia. <laughs> but uh, since I have no responsibilities anymore, I can only say if Betty and I had still lived in Alexandria and if we had voted there, I can't speak for her. God knows that. To be. <laughs> uh, I would have voted for Miller. Now, um, that brings up a question that I think is important. During the controversy, I often reflected on what was the job of the National Security Agency. If you go back and read the history, in 1947, the CIA was established as an organization. And in the same basic legislation, the NSC was established. And the NSC was established because presidents too often in the past had been handicapped by the propaganda that came from defense or state or treasury, and a president had no technical group that could advise him as to maybe an opposite point of view. It was a think tank, a think tank that gave the president this group of experts who could challenge the proposals from defense or state or otherwise. It was never contemplated that NSC would do field operations, never. Well. Ali North got into the field operations. If he was going to be in the field operations, he should have been with defense or some organization that was given by law the responsibility to operate with whatever he was doing. Whoever managed the NSC let it get off in the wrong direction. The NSC is a think tank operation. That was what the law said. And they somehow, whoever was managing it, and I'm not going to pass judgment on that, let these people get involved in all these outside activities. It, so I don't blame Colonel North. Uh, he was apparently told to or authorized or not controlled to undertake these operations. The point is, nobody from NSC should have been doing what he did, period. Uh, I guess you all know Betty and I think we're a part of the middle ground of the Republican Party. We've always been there. We expect to stay there, and we'll do what we can to help uh, those that follow that philosophy. Uh, well, the first follow-up on that, uh, you seem to be criticizing this fellow who ran against you in 76, Mr. Reagan. Is that uh, you saying that he should have had more control over the National Security Council? I didn't mention any names. <laughs> yes, uh, whether it was the president or somebody uh, representing him on the chief of staff, to be honest with you, the chief of staff should have been managing that. I mean, that's a detail. And uh, it would be my observation that it was not managed very well. This questioner says, recently former Michigan Gover Governor Milliken urged Republicans to forsake the divisive politics of the far right and to embrace its moderate members. Are you saying that you agree with this? Well, I thought Bill Milliken was a fine governor for the state of Michigan. And uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, I've always felt I was 
an internationalist in foreign policy, a responsible fiscal uh, advocate uh, with uh, a dedication to helping at the domestic level that we could afford. And I guess that puts me in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, given the 11th commandment of Republicans, thou shalt not <laughs> criticize other Republicans, do you think Senator Dole uh, should not be getting into the uh, Oliver North controversy now that North is nominated? Well, Bob Dole knows how to take care of himself. <laughs> he doesn't need any help from me. I'll let Bob answer that. You think Senator Warner knows how to take care of himself? <laughs> He hadn't been very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, getting on to a, another topic. <laughs> Maybe we'll get back to that one later. That's a good one. Democrats seem to be having trouble writing a health care reform bill. For the most part, Republicans have been refusing to cooperate. Do you see a way to get a bipartisan approach? Is a bipartisan approach necessary? Or has Clinton, uh, President Clinton turned off so many Republicans uh, that a bipartisan approach cannot happen? I spent a great deal of time uh, reading as much as I could, listening to as much as I could about the health care crisis. And I would share the view, I think, of most people that the 35 million people who are not covered by current health care health care programs and the 20 some million people who are under cared for uh, that does present a problem uh, in the health delivery to a good many americans i listened to the president's uh, several speeches on the subject and i thought it would make sense to get a copy of the actual document that the White House submitted to the Congress in legislative form to carry out their program. Have any of you seen it? Well, I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me from California, but it's a big document. It's 1,364 pages of how the new health care program is to be enacted into law. It's a massive document. There's no question about it. It revolutionizes health care in this country. Uh, I'm told by people that I respect in the Congress that if it were voted, uh, that document, up or down today, it would be defeated. No question about it. The question is, how far do you go from here to get some kind of a health care program? Well, you've got the Cooper Grandy bill, you've got the Whetstone bill, you've got the Chafee bill, I guess John Bro has a bill. I don't know how many versions. Uh, so it's a question is a pragmatic political solution. Where do you go from here and end up with something that'll be on the president's desk that he can veto. Uh, I'm not that knowledgeable on just where it might end up. First place, you've got three committees in the House that are exercising significant jurisdiction. Ways and Means, uh, Bill Ford's Committee on Labor and Education, John Dingell's Committee on whatever the new title is, then you have at least two committees in the Senate, maybe three. That's a tortuous legislative path, and time is getting short. I raise this question, or I raise two questions. There's no doubt that this piece of legislation, as proposed by the White House, gives health care from birth to death. That's a given. It is a massive entitlement program. Now, today, out of a federal budget of a trillion five hundred billion dollars a year, that's what Uncle Sam spends a year in cash. 
51 percent of that cash is for what we call entitlements. And either by new math or old math, that's something $750 billion a year. This bill that Clinton submitted would be the largest entitlement bill in the history of the United States. The question that I think is very legitimate, do you want to pile that heavy an entitlement program on top of the entitlement programs we have today? Let me illustrate. The current Social Security program is an entitlement program. And 40 to 45 million people a month get a check from the Treasury as a part of that entitlement program. Social Security is a minor league program compared to the health program as far as an entitlement is concerned. Social Security only serves 45 million people. The health care program is an entitlement program for 250 million people. Can the Congress handle that? They have a lot of trouble trying to make any rational decisions involving Social Security. Let me illustrate. In 1935, Congress said that people should be, get retirement at 65. As I recall, the uh, life expectancy then was about 66, 67. Today, life expectancy is what, 79? We're still letting people retire at 65. Now, there is law on the books that they put through two years ago or so under commission of Alan Greenspan's that raises it to 67, I think, after the turn of the century. That was a monumental change. All I'm saying is you put this entitlement program for 250 million people, every American, on the statute books you'll have a tough time ever making any responsible changes as problems arise. People get entitled to what government's going to do for them. And that worries me. One other question I have. It, the bill as raised by the White House establishes a national health board of seven politically appointed members. And that board, and I'm quoting from the bill, says, the National Health Board will determine what is medically necessary and appropriate, end quote. I think it's responsible to ask, do we want seven politically appointed people in Washington determining what is medically appropriate for me or you or anybody else? That's what the law says, or the way they propose it. So there are some legitimate questions, and I just hope the Congress uh, can find an answer between here and there, because we do have a problem of coverage. Do you think that can happen by the end of this term of uh, Congress? My guess is it's about 50-50, not much better than that. Mm -hmm. And what would have to happen to get it moving? Would, it, uh, would the president have to take a, a more conciliatory position? Would he have to change something? Would he have to take a more active role here? Or is this something that's going to happen just in Congress? Well, as I understand his comments, he will veto anything that does not provide for universal coverage. I believe that's what he said. Uh, of course, you can get interpretations. Did he mean universal coverage tomorrow? Or did he mean universal coverage two years from now or three years from now or whatever? I honestly believe there will have to be some compromise in that area. 
On to an, another topic. Uh, do you think the defense, the defense budget and U.S. military forces are being cut too deeply, given the state of the world and the threat of war, say, in Korea? I'm always prejudiced. Uh, I think the trend is to cut too deeply. Uh, at the height of the Cold War, we spent, what, 290-some billion dollars a year, something like that. Um, my recollection is in this fiscal year, we're going to spend about 260 billion. Is that right, Marty? Uh, that uh, I think we can get by on at the present time. But there are people uh, who, for good reasons and good conscience, think the Pentagon is uh, a good fertile field to pick up some money for other programs. I worry when we get our manpower. The height of the Cold War, we were about two million two in the three services in uniform. What is it, a million six now about, Bart? I hesitate to go below uh, that figure under the current challenges we face uh, uh, on a global basis. Because one of those problem areas is Haiti. We have an awful lot of questioners who want to know uh, what. If you were president, what would you do about the situation in Haiti? I would not undertake a U.S. military operation in Haiti, period. Uh, I don't have that kind of faith in uh, Aristide, and I look back on the history of U.S. occupation of Haiti for many, many, many years. Uh, it was not a successful op operation then. Uh, I don't think it's the place for us on a basis of whether Haiti is the restoration of Aristide and Haiti is in our national security interest. I don't see that. Uh, any sanctions I think are appropriate, but I would not commit a U.S. military operation to restore Mr. Aristide to the head of the government in Haiti. Uh, then what would you do about the refugee crisis? Would you do something different from what uh, President Clinton is doing? Well, I uh, understand the problem of the boat people, but I do not think under the criteria of which is as I understand the directive or the law, the boat people have to, uh, refugees have to be uh, taken in the United States if it involves political asylum. I would raise the question as to whether all of the boat people would qualify under that criteria. Uh, those that are legitimate, they ought to be sifted out and permitted to come but I would not let them come in uh, open-ended. Switching over to Bosnia, uh, this question says, for three years now, the world community has done little to stop the war in Bosnia. What are your feelings on this tragedy, and what would you like to say to President Clinton and the international community at this time? Should the arms embargo be lifted? I don't think our policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Bosnia, or what was Yugoslavia has been very successful from the end of the um, Cold War. I don't think the Bush administration was terribly successful, and I don't think the current administration is doing any better. Uh, in my judgment, uh, uh, we've been off and on, vigorous and backtracking. Uh, I think we ought to lift the arms embargo to let the uh, Bosnia Muslims get whatever arms so they can defend themselves. A couple of weeks ago, it looked like uh, there was a settlement, uh, uh, the bombing of Sarajevo and Garadza uh, were s called off, but now I read uh, every other day that that so-called peace settlement is falling apart and you're going to have a resumption of 
uh, ethnic cleansing, etc. So um, it's not a good situation, and we, I don't think, handled it very well from the very beginning. You served with Dan Rostenkowski for some 15 years. Uh, what did you think of the indictment, the charges against him? Uh, is this uh, something that surprised you? And uh, also, of course, then, uh, has the Rostenkowski situation endangered the health care bill? I'll answer the uh, last question first. Uh, no question. Uh, Danny not being chairman will uh, hurt the necessary negotiations on behalf of President Clinton to get the health care th through. There's no doubt about the practicality. Sam Gibbons is a fine person, a good friend of mine, but uh, Dan always has been a masterful operator of negotiations.